Will you join your hearts with me in prayer? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Six years ago, a group of us from ERUCC and friends were standing at the Jordan River, somewhere near where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptizer. And we walked into that water and we splashed some of it on our faces and reminded ourselves of our own baptisms. We remembered that when Jesus was baptized, the voice of God came from the clouds and said, this is my son, the beloved. And while there were no divine voices coming from heaven over us that day, we were reminded that when each of us was baptized, we too were claimed as beloved children of God. Our family, our church community claimed us as a beloved child of God. We remembered in that moment that our parents, our godparents, our sponsors, and a congregation promised to be with us on our life's journey. Like Jesus, through our baptism, we have been marked by water and the Holy Spirit. And like Jesus, we will spend our lifetimes living out our faith and calling as those beloved children of God. Today we read that right after his baptism, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, full from that high moment, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. And it was in these days that Jesus wrestled with his identity and what it meant to be the Son of God. He had all kinds of powers to do all kinds of things, and yet, and yet, he withstood those temptations to be someone other than who God called him to be. He faced the temptation to give in to hunger, to power, to prestige. And it's important to note that in our, our scriptures, the, the word devil that is translated as devil is with a little d. It's not the big D personified that we think of a devil with you know horns and going around with a red cloak. This is a power. This is a tempter. This is the power that comes to Jesus to try to get him to forget who he is and what his ministry is to be all about. We read this story of the temptation from one of the Gospels every year on the first Sunday in Lent because this is when we begin our journey to Easter. Uh, the 40 days to Easter, we don't count Sundays, the 40 days in Lent. And it's a season when we're called to remember who we are and to consider the ways in which we too can be tempted to forget our identity as beloved children of God. So in baptism, we claim, we claim that we are not alone as we wrestle with temptations. We can look to Jesus as the example who called upon God, called upon tradition, called upon scriptures to be able to say at every push, at every enticement, to do something other than what he was called to do. In each of those moments, Jesus reached back and remembered and found the strength to say no. I don't know about you, but it does give me some comfort to know that Jesus struggled and was tempted. It gives me some hope that like Jesus, I can call upon God to give me the strength to say no whenever there is something that may want to draw me away from the person God has called me to be. And as Esther so eloquently read, you'd think that once Jesus did this in the, t in the wilderness one time, that would be it. But we read those haunting words at the end of Luke's story where he says, after the tempter had challenged Jesus, he departed from him until an opportune time. You see, baptism isn't some kind of magical cloak. You know, it's not some kind of superstar, superpower, you know, protection from all the bad things that can happen in life. Rather, it is the mark of knowing that we are not alone in those moments of wilderness and desert experiences and in those moments of temptation. We can have, as Jesus reminded us in his time in the wilderness, you can have all the food in the world, 
but it may not fill you up. It's not love. You can have all the power in the world, and you can still be unhappy. You can have every material thing you can think about and still be miserable and tempted to try and gain more. So it's a good reminder to us that when the time of temptation comes, we have to reach back and remember that others have gone before us. And we can say no. We can find strength in those of persons of faith who have gone before us. And we can find strength in our prayer life. We can find strength in going to the scriptures. We can find strength in one another. Like so many of you, I am really struggling with the brutality and the horror of what's happening in the Ukraine. We may be tempted to say that the solution is blowing Putin up and all of Russia with him. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I'm pretty sure that by harming the Russian people is not the way that Jesus would want us to go. I don't have answers, except that it seems to me history has taught us that fighting hate with hate only brings about more hate. And so I'm struggling with this, as I know many of you are. And we certainly don't want to see what has happened in history before, where there's this slow progression of horror that will go across Europe as the slow progression of horror has gone over so many other parts of the world. So when I'm tempted to think that way, I start to draw hope from the thousands of people like us that are praying all around the world, millions and millions of people who are raising up voices in prayer. I'm finding hope in those persons of faith who are gathering in subway stations and in basements of buildings and holding services of worship and praying and supporting each other. I'm finding hope in the thousands of people in neighboring countries like Poland and Hungary who are opening their private homes to people that they had never met until that moment at the train station. I'm finding hope in the images, as I saw yesterday, of women leaving strollers at the train station in case someone arrives and they need a place to put their child um, as they are fleeing. I am finding hope in seeing people in Russia who we know their lives are endangered going to protest in Red Square because that's not who they believe they are as the Russian people. I am finding hope in the ways in which the world is coming together and saying this is not what it means to be the world. I can draw from that hope because there is a time in history where you and I remember through our German friends that people packed churches and prayed for peace. And that wall came down. That wall came down without a tank hitting it. That wall came down because people came together and said, no, that's not who we are and how we want to live. I draw hope because I know that God is with the suffering people of Ukraine and all the people of the world in this wilderness and desolate and horrible experience. So you need to know that that's why Lent to me is more than giving up caffeine or chocolate or whatever else. That's way too easy. That's way too easy. This is a season for us to dig deep and to dig hard and reflect and, and be about what it means for us to consider what tempts us, what gets in the way of our living a full life, to examine our lives and reflect what needs to be stripped away so that we can hold on to that which will last. We need to consider what to take on, what behaviors to adapt and what behaviors to adopt in order to live a full life. So I'm inviting you to think about these questions during Lent. Who do you trust for your nourishment? Whom do you trust with your service, with your lives? And whom do you trust to love and care for you? Today, as we place the water on Iris's head, we claimed her as a child of God. And we prayed that no sin would have power over her. And we promised to be with her and her family 
as, and all of us as we raise her in the life of faith to remember that she belongs not only to God, but to all of us. And we remembered that Iris is not alone on life's journey. And we did that as we affirmed our own faith and stated once again that we are not alone on this journey. Temptations are gonna come our way all the time and some are gonna be very alluring, but we don't need to fear it. We don't need to fear those temptations. We don't need to fear those dry places. We don't need to fear the wilderness. We know that the people of Israel emerged stronger after their 40 years. We know that Jesus emerged from his 40 days in the wilderness so solid in his understanding of his mission and ministry. The wilderness is a place of peril and challenge, but it can also be a place of growth. And the wilderness is always a reminder for us to remember that no matter where we are, no matter where we go on life's journey, God's spirit is always with us. So into our cracked places of life, into those moments when we feel deserted, let us remember that God's love and grace is always brimming over, even when we don't feel it, that God is always with us. So when we went back to the Jordan River, you look at it and you say, oh, that's the Jordan River? Like, it's nothing remarkable to look at. It's a muddy stream of water. You put your feet in the murky waters and you'd say, okay. But the power of being in that place, like the power of a baptism, like the power of reminding us that we've been blessed by water in the spirit is a reminder that we are not alone on this journey. So may these weeks ahead be a time for us to remember that and to give God thanks for God's overflowing love that fills us to the brim. Amen.